Hi, it's Katrina. Mount Nemrut. Nemrut's Dagi is an archaeological site steeped in mystery with a pretty complex past. The fall of Alexander the Great left his vast empire broken into pieces. Many small kingdoms rose to power to fill the vacuum and absorbed citizens and created new territories and new armies. One of these tiny kingdoms was known as Kamajin, located in modern-day Turkey. It was founded in the 2nd century BC and had a pretty turbulent existence for about 200 years before ultimately being absorbed into the Roman Empire. But even though the kingdom only prospered for a short time, it left behind an architectural legacy of burial mounds and funeral statuary with the most prominent being Nemrut Dagi. This place holds the mausoleum dedicated to the most powerful king of the Commagene, known as Antiochus I Theos. He led Commagene to its height in the 1st century BC as he switched allegiances between the Romans and the Parthians. His brief and violent rule over the kingdom is commemorated by a massive sandstone statue sitting at the top of Mount Nemrut. By many accounts, he was self-obsessed and dangerous and created a royal cult to build large statues to himself. He wanted to be buried in a high and holy place near the gods and preserved for eternity. However, despite efforts by archaeologists in the 20th century, no one has been able to find the king's burial chamber. There has been absolutely no evidence to suggest he was buried at the location of his statue, even though all historical texts say that he was. The mountain is often referred to as the throne of the gods, and people come from all over at dawn and at dusk to see the large stone heads glow gold. Until the 1960s, the only way to get there was by donkey or by foot, which would take hours and hours. Another interesting relic here is the oldest work of art depicting a handshake between a king and his sister. The large heads of statues are the heads of gods, and while some are rumored to have bodies buried underneath the earth, like the Moai of Easter Island, it seems like at some point the heads were removed from their bodies and then placed on the ground. But much of this place remains a mystery. The Temple People of Malta the mysterious ancient temple people civilization of Malta had a culture rich with art, stone temples, and massive burial sites, with their most infamous relics being scattered across the islands of both Malta and Gozo. They had very advanced agriculture back in 4000 BC, and all the way until they vanished suddenly around 2900 BC. And yet the stone structures that they built are still standing today on the island of Malta, making the whole island an extremely curious archaeological location. Even to this day, researchers are still striving to answer two very critical questions. First, what happened to the temple people? Secondly, why do some cultures survive for millennia while others do not? Throughout the island of Malta and Gozo, there are about 30 temple complexes built by the temple people over the course of about 1100 years. According to Malta Today, they practiced intricate burial rituals, including animal sacrifices. But one of the most progressive parts of their civilization was definitely their creative craft. Archaeologists have found hundreds of statues and dozens of works of art, and this has raised a huge question of how exactly this ancient civilization managed to master such unique artistic techniques since they were isolated on these two small islands. And here's where this site gets even more mysterious. The temple people did not leave a single written document behind. There are no historical texts, they aren't written about by other cultures, and the only way archaeologists can unravel their mystery is by looking at the artifacts they left behind. But even still, almost nothing is known about the temple people today. The First Viking Settlement In one of the most rural provinces of Canada, there is a mysterious archaeological site known as Lands Au Meadows, and it's home to what experts say is the first settlement in North America by European people. The original site wasn't found until the 1960s, but it has since turned into one of the most important archaeological places in the whole country. Located in Newfoundland, scientists now believe Vikings landed from Europe before anyone else. There have been ruins of Viking settlements found in Greenland, but it really wasn't until the 60s when Lanzell Meadows was discovered that we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Vikings did in fact make it to North America first. They actually called this place Vinland. As for the settlement, the remains of eight Viking buildings were discovered, each one dating back to around the year 1000 AD. While that might not seem extraordinarily old, it's still 1000 years ago, and many hundreds of years before the invasion of the Europeans in North America. However, the evidence does show that the Vikings didn't get very far. Archaeologists discovered nuts, workshops, iron tools, and a lot of local wood. The Vikings had definitely explored the area, but they likely didn't make it to the other end of Newfoundland. And to make things even more ironic, Newfoundland is an island. They never even made it to the mainland. Tal Berna 
Tel Berna is one of the most misunderstood archaeological sites in Israel. Back during the Iron Age, this place acted as a border between the kingdoms of Philistia and Judah. Many scholars actually believe that the site of Tel Berna was once the location of the biblical town of Libna, which was allegedly conquered by Joshua, who then gave it to the tribe of Judah. Do you follow? Even today, the fortifications around this ancient city are still visible. It was actually important throughout the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, with excavations revealing relics dating as far back as the 7th century BC. It was even active during the reign of the Persians. The first archaeological excavations happened in the summer of 2010, with help from archaeologists affiliated with Bar Ilan University. They found that the main fortifications built in the Iron Age were never again used, even though the town itself was. And the program director, Isaac Shai, has made claims that the site is definitely the ancient city of Libna. This would make it one of the few excavations confirmed as a true Judean site, and one of the most important biblical digs ever undertaken in Israel. And yet, despite all the research, archaeologists have only scratched the surface of this place. It will be years before Tel Berna and all its mysteries are fully uncovered. Lan Na Kingdom Palace In one of the most shocking archaeological discoveries in recent memory, a long-lost palace was found during the demolition of a Thai prison, making it the newest and most impressive sites in the whole country. This happened in Chiang Mai, when the Chiang Mai's Women's Correctional Center was demolished to make way for a public park. But according to Thai PBS, all of that was put on hold when the extensive ruins of this ancient site were found underneath its foundation, along with a trove of ancient artifacts, all of which apparently date back to the early Lan Na Kingdom of the Mangrai Dynasty. No one had any idea they were even there. Researchers are now arguing that the area should be preserved and not turned into a park, considering its historical value. The Lan Na Kingdom was founded by Mangrai the King sometime in the 13th century, becoming one of the first important Thai kingdoms. It has huge historical significance for the country. The capital city was located in Chiang Rai, which King Mangrai named after himself. When the king died, there was a lot of royal turmoil, and the Lan Na Kingdom declined in the 1500s, while the Kingdom of Ayutthaya came to power in the south. But the bones of this old civilization are still around, and this new site in Chiang Mai has yet to reveal even half of its secrets. Armenian Divination Shrines Researchers from Cornell University have just discovered three shrines inside of a secretive hilltop fortress in Armenia that they believe are 3,300 years old. They were most likely used for divination and for predicting the future. Each shrine is a single room which features a clay basin filled with ash. Each room was also found with numerous artifacts still inside, such as clay idols, horns, stamp seals, and a huge amount of animal bones with markings on them. Diviners likely used these ancient shrines to tell the future after burning intoxicating substances and drinking a lot of wine to alter their mental state and be able to communicate more easily with the gods. The shrines were discovered at the entrance of a fortress in Gegharot, which is already one of the most impressive yet mysterious archaeological sites in the entire country. There were at least three forms of divination practice at the site, including osteomancy, which involved rolling animal knuckle bones like dice, and then lithomancy, which used colored pebbles. But even with the power of seeing the future, the hilltop fortress was still destroyed and burned down during various conflicts in the area. Writing had not yet come to this part of the country, so there are no written records left behind of who this group may have been. The fact that the stone ruins are still around at all is something of a miracle, though to be honest, the site has been so badly destroyed over the years that archaeologists are having a difficult time trying to reveal all of the secrets of these divine foreseers. Por Bajin Por Bajin is one of Russia's most bizarre archaeological sites. It sits on a tiny island directly in the center of a remote lake in the Russian Republic of Tuva, which is very high in the mountains, and only about 20 miles from the border of Mongolia. Most experts agree that the structures on the island were made by the Uyghurs, a nomadic people who lived all throughout Mongolia, Siberia, and even parts of China, and who are currently still living in the north of China under great persecution. The archaeological site only takes up about 7.5 acres, yet there are more than 30 buildings, and the entire place is surrounded by a massive defensive wall 40 feet high. A researcher named Sergei Soju, who worked on many different archaeological digs in the area, put together the Por Bajin Cultural Foundation in 2007 to discover the secrets of this strange place. But all these years later, Por Bajin is still steeped in mystery.
Perhaps the strangest piece of evidence here is that the city is laid out quite similarly to the Forbidden City in China, which was the seat of over 24 different emperors. This has led researchers to believe that the town of Porbajin was constructed during a time when the Chinese emperor was forcibly converting the Uyghur Empire to the Chinese religion of Manichaeism back between 618 and 907. It may have been one of the last major fortresses where the Uyghur people were free to follow their beliefs. The Lost Temple of Musasir Just a few years ago, a long-lost temple dedicated to a supreme god was discovered in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. The temple dates back over 2,500 years, to a time when the Assyrians and Scythians were fighting for dominance over present-day Iraq. What's really incredible is that the human-sized statues on the ruins of the temple were actually found by villagers, not by archaeologists. Field work didn't begin until 2005, when students from Leiden University in the Netherlands went to this mysterious site to begin their investigations. The Lost Temple was found in an area ruled by the nearby city of Musasir in the Iron Age, known as the City of the Raven, and it was likely dedicated to the god Haldi, who was the supreme god of the kingdom of Urartu. It was an incredibly important location in the region. It was also apparently looted by the Assyrians in 714 BC. However, the location of the temple has been lost to historians even before Christ was born, making this discovery nothing short of miraculous. Unfortunately, this temple has not been properly excavated yet. One of the main reasons for this is that it's in an extremely dangerous area where there are unexploded mines that can kill the ignorant explorer. There are also occasional border disputes, with the National Iraqi News Agency reporting recently that Iran had been firing artillery over the border. Obviously, this is not the kind of place most archaeologists are going to be spending their summer. The Underground Italian Pyramids Underground pyramids have just been discovered underneath a wine cellar in the Italian city of Orvieto. This has turned into one of the strangest archaeological sites in all of Italy. Underneath the wine cellar, archaeological experts David B. George and Claudio Bizzarri discovered tapered walls, a series of tunnels, and ancient stairs all carved into the stone, suggesting there had been huge and hollow pyramids built underneath the city by the ancient Etruscans. The reason this is so interesting is because the pyramids are under the ground, made of negative space. The underground structures had been built over in medieval times, and then again in the 20th century, forcing the archaeologists to dig through several different eras of ruins. But the dig was definitely worth it. The researchers found Etruscan pottery dating back to around 1000 BC. They also found evidence that there could be more pyramids even deeper underground, though it's currently almost impossible to dig down that far. As for who exactly the Etruscans were, well, that's also a bit of a mystery. These enigmatic people apparently taught the French how to make wine, the Romans how to construct their roads, and they even introduced writing as an art form throughout all of Europe. These people thrived in a land called Etruria, which used to be in modern-day Tuscany and central Italy. This was until around 300 BC, when the Romans grew in such power that they eventually absorbed the Etruscans and their culture was sucked into the Great Roman Empire. Circe Island On November 14, 1963, a crew sailing on a trawler near the shores of Iceland saw a mysterious puff of smoke coming out of the ocean. Minutes later, Circe Island was born. At first, the ship captain thought it was a boat on fire. He apparently maneuvered his vessel to investigate, only to find an island literally being born right before his eyes. There were explosive eruptions coming from below the sea surface, gradually giving rise to what would end up being an island around 2,000 feet long and over 147 feet above sea level. But what's really amazing is that the eruption went on for three and a half years and didn't end until June of 1967. During that time, you would definitely not have wanted to visit this island, as you would have choked on the ash and probably died. Today, most of the island is already gone. In 2002, the island was reduced to only 0.54 square miles, according to the Surtsey Research Society. At its current rate of erosion, the island will be completely gone by 2100. And even though this might seem like a cool place to visit, it's not recommended because it's literally in the middle of nowhere. And besides, it's forbidden anyway. This place is a nature reserve dedicated to the study of how plants, insects, and other types of life establish themselves on a new piece of land. North Brother Island North Brother Island is one of the most terrifying forbidden islands in the world. It's located in New York between Rikers and Manhattan Island. Many people in the city don't even know that this place exists, and that might be for a good reason. 
North Brother Island from the 1880s and onward was used as a quarantine location for people who were infected with deadly diseases, including the extremely infamous Typhoid Mary. Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid, accused of infecting over 50 people. It was ultimately abandoned in 1963 after a failed attempt at being a drug rehabilitation center. As of now, it is illegal to visit the island without permission from the city, not only because it's a hazardous ruin most likely still filled with diseases, but also because it's a bird sanctuary. According to Business Insider, producers for the Science Channel managed to get a special permit from the city to visit the island in 2017, and the rough shape of the forgotten ruins were documented as being the spookiest place in New York. Even if you could visit North Brother Island, you probably wouldn't want to. Nihau Island Nihau Island is the most mysterious Hawaiian island of them all. It's actually known as the Forbidden Island, and it's been privately owned since 1864 by the same family, after being bought by a woman named Elizabeth Sinclair from King Kamehameha V of the Kingdom of Hawaii for $10,000. According to Bruce Robinson, who currently owns the island alongside his brother, it has largely remained unchanged since the 1860s. The island is actually in pristine condition and considered a critical habitat for many different endangered species. It's also one of the most desired destinations for tourism in the world. This is because nobody is allowed on it. You literally cannot go, so don't even think about it. One of the reasons for this was that back during the polio epidemic of 1952, the island was completely shut down and nobody was allowed to visit unless they had a doctor's certificate. And even then, they had a two-week quarantine. As a result, the Forbidden Island never had a single case of polio. See, they were already prepared for 2020. Don't worry, not even rock stars get a special treatment here. For example, ABC News recently reported that Mick Jagger tried to get permission to land some of his helicopters on the island and was firmly denied. The royalty of the world, the billionaires among us, and even Hollywood's favorites all get the same treatment. Nobody may enter. Gas Mask Island Gas Mask Island in Japan is one of the most toxic places in the world. It's properly known as Miyakejima, and it's a small island just south of Tokyo that sits on top of an active volcanic chain that has erupted no less than six times in the last 100 years. But the people who live here don't only face the constant threat of a volcanic eruption, they also have to deal with the highest concentrations of sulfur and other poisonous gases in the world, which regularly leak upwards through the ground. Even as recently as 2000, a mass evacuation happened when insanely high levels of toxic gas appeared after one of the volcanoes erupted. For eight years, all flights into the area were forbidden. The residents of the island weren't allowed to return home until 2005, and even then they were ordered to carry a gas mask with them every second of every day. This really makes you wonder why anyone would even want to live here at all. The real danger about visiting this island, even though it's not forbidden anymore, is that you could wake up in the middle of the night to a wailing siren warning you to put on your gas mask. In fact, gas masks are even available upon your arrival on the island, and you can purchase them in almost every tourist shop. Gruinard Island There is an island about half a mile from the Scottish coast that was once so contaminated by bioweapons that nobody was allowed anywhere near it for fear that they could accidentally spread anthrax all over the globe. This island is known as Grenard Island, and it's only about 1.2 miles in length. It's covered with trees, and it was allegedly used as a hideout for thieves in the 16th century. So far as historical records show, only six people have ever been recorded residing on the island. But since the 1920s, not a single soul has lived there. But here's where the germ warfare comes in. It was in 1942 that military forces tried to create a germ bomb to unleash on the Germans, hoping to decimate their food supply with the anthrax bacteria, thereby completely shutting down the Nazi army. The strain chosen was Volum 14578, and it was thought to be more fatal than other strains of anthrax, which meant it would lead to more and more infections. Meteorologist Sir Oliver Graham Sutton went to the island with a team of around 50 men and 80 sheep to test out the weaponized anthrax. It was known casually as Operation Vegetarian. According to Ripley's Believe It or Not, the anthrax actually proved too deadly, killing all the sheep and contaminating everything on the island and making it completely uninhabitable. The plan was canceled, and the weaponized anthrax, as far as we know, was put to rest. Ramri Island Ramri Island was the site of the worst crocodile attack in history. It was the end of World War II, and hundreds of trapped Japanese soldiers were trying to make it on foot across Ramri Island in the Bay of Bengal. 
but crossing the island proved far more dangerous than they could have anticipated. The issue here is that Ramri Island is basically a swamp, and it is riddled with massive crocodiles. Crocodiles are the largest reptiles on the planet, reaching over 20 feet long and weighing over 2,000 pounds. About 1,000 Japanese soldiers found themselves separated from the rest of their army and outgunned by British Royal Marines. They took their chances and fled into the mangrove swamps, but the saltwater crocodiles saw them coming. It was reported at the time that only about 480 out of the 1,000 Japanese troops survived the hungry crocs. Survivors told stories of dozens of crocodiles attacking the soldiers. All they could hear was the gunfire and screams. Of course, the death toll estimates do vary quite a bit, but there's no denying the fact that this was the biggest crocodile attack in history, confirmed by the Guinness Book of World Records. North Sentinel Island North Sentinel Island is home to some of the most reclusive people on the planet. Called the Sentinelese, according to Forbes magazine, they defend their home fiercely and have only been contacted a handful of times by the outside world throughout the last 200 years, with every incident ending badly, pierced by arrows. Missionaries and explorers, shipwrecked crew and escaped convicts have all confronted the Sentinelese and it often ended in violence. Now the Sentinelese are protected by the government, who has made it illegal to go near them for their own safety and for the safety of outsiders. It's been estimated that there are only between 80 and 150 people on North Sentinel Island, though to be fair it could be as many as 500 or as few as 10. Nobody really knows. Anthropological studies from afar have tried to see how the Sentinelese are able to survive in the tough island conditions. Fishermen and poachers often break the law and invade their space, which could bring disease as well as violence. They try to fish close to the shore or get animals that they can sell. The Sentinelese keep an eye out and are ready to protect their island to the death. As for their heritage, they are related to other indigenous groups in the area, specifically people who come from the Andaman Islands. However, because they have been isolated for so long, they have their own language that nobody else can understand, and they aren't really up for teaching it. There was one single successful visit to their village in 1967 when it was revealed that they lived in huts, they used canoes to travel around, and they lived by fishing and harvesting crabs. And the really interesting fact is that even though the people who live here are called the Sentinelese, nobody actually knows what they prefer to be called themselves since nobody can actually ask them. Snake Island Snake Island off the coast of Brazil is home to one of the deadliest and most feared snakes in the world. The entire island is infested with anywhere between 2,000 and 4,000 golden lancehead vipers. These snakes are so dangerous that they can kill a person in under an hour with a single bite. Oh, and the venom can and will melt your skin right off. Anyone who wanders onto the shores of this island is immediately at risk of being bitten which is exactly why not just anybody is allowed on it. Local legends tell the story of the last lighthouse keeper and his family who died when the snake slithered into his home through the window and bit them all to death. While some people believe the snakes were put there by pirates to protect their treasure, they actually evolved there all on their own over thousands of years. Over time, they became isolated on the island and had to adapt to find prey. But why are they so venomous? Smithsonian Magazine reports that when the snakes ran out of prey on the ground, they took to the skies, climbing up trees and preying on migratory birds. The venom had to be really strong to be able to bring down a bird quickly, and they couldn't afford to wait to bite it again. Because it's so dangerous, the Brazilian government controls all visits and issues special permits to biologists and researchers. A doctor must be present on all visits just in case something happens. Battleship Island Battleship Island in Japan is one of the darkest and creepiest forbidden islands anywhere on Earth. It's currently devoid of human life, with buildings that are crumbling to dust, giving it that post-apocalyptic vibe. But this place was once the most densely populated area on Earth at its peak, with 5,000 people living on just 16 acres of cement-covered island. Mitsubishi Group purchased the island in the mid-19th century as a coal mining area. The bustling community became a coal-producing powerhouse, and miners and their families flocked there to work deep in the coal tunnels. Known now as Battleship Island because of its shape, it was also called the Island Without Green, since there were no trees or flowers or any vegetation to be seen. The island lasted for almost 100 years as an enclosed ecosystem with housing complexes, shops, and even schools. But once the coal reserves began to run out and petroleum reared its ugly head, the mines were shut down and the people left forever in 1974. Life there was harsh, but there is an even darker chapter in the history of Battleship Island. 
During World War II, Korean and Chinese prisoners of war were transported to this island and used in a slave labor workforce. They had to work long hours in 100-degree weather deep in the dark ground while wearing only their underwear. Some estimates have placed the death toll of foreign workers at over 1,000 between the 1930s and the surrender of Japan at the end of the war. Everyone on the island, employees and prisoners of war, lived a similar life, with terrible conditions, a lack of hygiene and malnourishment. The prisoners were easily replaced, and nobody cared if they dropped dead from exhaustion. The walls of this place have seen many sad stories and dark secrets. Over time, the coal dried up, and by 1975, it was completely deserted. As of 2009, the island is less forbidden than it once was, and you can now visit, but you have to go through an official tour and must remain on the walkway at all times because buildings are collapsing by the minute. Poveglia Island Near the popular tourist destination of Venice in Italy, there is a forbidden island with a twisted, dark, and violent past. It's known as Poveglia Island or Plague Island, and many locals call it like hell, but in Italy. It was built by the Venetian government and used from between 1793 and 1814 as a plague quarantine station. It was just one of many such island stations found in the Venetian lagoon. It has been said that over 160,000 infected people lived out their final hours on the island, with as much as 50% of the island's soil consisting of decomposed human remains. There have even been mass graves recently found on other nearby islands containing thousands of corpses of plague victims. As for Poveglia, there has yet to be any digging, and so there have yet to be any bodies found. And as if that wasn't gruesome enough, Napoleon even used the island for a more sinister purpose, storing heaps of weapons on the island while he was in power. Then in 1922, after all this plague and Napoleon nonsense was over, a mental hospital was opened there. There is even a local legend that states one of the doctors at the hospital tortured and murdered dozens of his victims and then died when he fell from the top of the bell tower. The hospital shut its doors in 1968, but the ruins can still be seen today, though of course you are not allowed to visit. That said, if you really want to explore an island that housed a plague factory and an insane asylum, there are other islands in the lagoon that are open for visitors. Underground Labyrinth Beneath modern-day Rome, there is a maze of tunnels and quarries dating all the way back to the ancient city's beginnings. Several years ago, out of a concern that ground-level buildings and other structures would collapse into the voids below, experts embarked on a mission to map out this ancient subterranean labyrinth. Their concerns were certainly justified. Between just 2011 and 2013, there were 83 recorded incidents of structures collapsing into the tunnels. The scientists operated with the goal of preventing future collapses into a quarry system that Roman citizens have a long history of taking into their own hands. The common way is to take some big plastic bags and fill them with cement and stick them in the holes, geoscientist Giuseppina Caesar told Life Science. Rome was built mainly upon a type of volcanic rock called tuff, which is strong and easy to mine. Early Roman architects relied heavily on it in their projects, but they were sophisticated in their techniques, including keeping the quarry's tunnels narrow enough for the buildings above them to remain supported. But the subsequent generations widened the tunnels, and Mother Nature took an inevitable toll on the rock once it was exposed to air. After the quarrying stopped, Rome's residents repurposed the labyrinth several times, using the tunnels as catacombs, for mushroom farming, as a sewer, and even as a bomb shelter during World War II. Using 3D laser scanning, Kaiser and her colleagues identified weak areas in the tunnels and physically entered portions that were deemed safe. City government officials had compromised areas filled with mortar rather than simply patched up. This may seem extreme, but it's also necessary. As Kaisar said, a crack never stops on its own. It always gets bigger. Saint Valentine's Skull Saint Valentine of Terni, known as the patron saint of couples for defending Christian marriage, was beaten and decapitated on February 14th sometime during the 3rd century. This event inspired what we now know as Valentine's Day, a holiday that revolves around romance and love. What many people don't know, besides the fact that Valentine's Day stemmed from the beheading of a saint, is that the first version of this holiday was a feast celebrating Saint Valentine's execution. Historian Lisa Bittell explained that there were several Saint Valentines who were supposedly executed on February 14th, including two that died during the reign of Emperor Claudius Gothicus in 269 to 270 AD, during one of the most brutal periods of Christian persecution. The Valentine who died during the 3rd century was the first to be executed. 
Little else is known about the other two Valentines. Legend holds there was a Valentinus who lived before the 3rd century Valentine and died in Africa, but evidence of these claims is scarce. Today, the minor basilica of Santa Maria in Cosmedin, near Rome's Circus Maximus, claims to house the skull of the 3rd century Saint Valentine. Located in what was once a Greek community within Rome, the basilica's construction began during the 8th century atop the ruins of a Roman temple. It is unclear how St. Valentine's remains reached the Byzantine church after reportedly being uncovered in Rome during the early 19th century. Other churches throughout Europe claim to house relics of the other Valentines, but the alleged authenticity of these and the 3rd century skull is hard to determine. Eisenoi Coins Turkey is home to many famous ancient cities and archaeological sites, so it takes something really rare to surprise archaeologists. While working in Eisenoi, an ancient Greek city in western Turkey's Kutaya province in September 2019, archaeologists unearthed a hoard of Roman-era silver coins in a jug buried near a stream. Dating back roughly 2,100 years, there were 651 coins, consisting of 439 ancient Roman denarii, as well as 212 silver coins known as Sistophori, from the ancient Greek city of Pergamum, located in modern-day northwestern Turkey. All the coins date back to between 75 BC and 4 BC. Many were minted in southern Italy and bear portraits of various Roman emperors, including Caesar, Brutus, Mark Antony, and Augustus Young. The backs of the coins feature various scenes, including one depicting the Trojan hero Aeneas, an ancestor of the legendary twins Romulus and Remus, who founded the city of Rome. Eisenoi is home to one of the best-preserved temples dedicated to Zeus, and just last year, archaeologists began restoration work on the ancient city. In an interview with Live Science, Elif Ozer, who participated in the excavation, explained that it's likely a high-ranking soldier came to Azanoi, and he must have buried these coins here for a reason we do not know yet. He and his team are working on making a riverboat project so visitors can explore the historical ruins on sailboats, just like the Romans did thousands of years ago. Ancient Pay Stub Around 1,900 years ago, a Roman soldier named Gaius Messius received a pay stub detailing how he was broke after having his wages docked for certain items. Written on papyrus, the slip reveals that Messius, who participated in the Siege of Masada, one of the final battles of the First Jewish-Roman War, received just 50 denarii after paying for barley, food, clothing, and military equipment. Messias was likely stationed at the Masada Fortress in the Judean Desert between 72 and 75 AD. One of the soldier's deductions was for livestock fodder, indicating to experts that he may have been a legionary cavalryman who traveled with an animal he was responsible for feeding. His unit remains unknown. All that's known of Gaius Messias is what researchers have gleaned from the pay stub that left him effectively penniless. Joseph Flavius, the only known historical source for the Siege of Masada, wrote that the Jewish rebels, who had initially tried to stand up against the Romans, committed mass suicide once they were surrounded. It's unknown whether this is true, and some experts question the validity of this narrative. Designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2001, the site's ruins are one of Israel's most popular tourist destinations the tomb of Romulus. Last year, archaeologists found what might possibly be the underground tomb of Rome's mythical founder, Romulus, beneath the ancient city's forum. Surrounded by a temple or a hypogeum, the subterranean burial is thought to date back to the 6th century BC. The four-and-a-half-foot-long stone sarcophagus the tomb contains was found empty, despite ancient Romans' belief that it held Romulus's remains. Inside the chamber, which contains a hidden entrance located northwest of the Forum, is a votive altar dedicated to Romulus. Speaking with the media, Colosseum Archaeological Park Director Alfonsina Russo, who oversees the city's ruins, explained the tomb's entrance is located under a building known as the Casa Julia, or Senate House. The tomb itself is situated beneath the Comitium, Rome's central meeting place for votes by public assembly. Also near the tomb is a shrine called the Lapis Niger, or the Black Stone. Paved with black marble, it was thought to cause bad luck. The alleged site where jealous Senate members supposedly murdered Romulus is marked by the stone block. Some historians do not think that Romulus ever existed, despite legendary claims that he lived during the 8th century BC. According to the story, Romulus and his twin brother Remus were the grandsons of Numitor, the deposed king of the Latin city of Alba Longa, their father was the god Mars, and their mother was Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia. 
Romulus and Remus were abandoned on the bank of the Tiber River, where a she-wolf found them and raised them until a shepherd rescued them. The pair went on to become quite successful, restoring Numitor to the throne and building a city overlooking the site where they were found as infants. The problem was that the twins didn't really get along. When the brothers could not agree on where exactly that was, Romulus and his supporters killed Remus before establishing Rome on Palatine Hill. Nijmegen Helbet During the 1st or 2nd century AD, a Roman warrior passed through what is now the Dutch city of Nijmegen and left his helmet behind. Rediscovered in 1915 in a gravel bed on the bank of the Wall River, the helmet was given the name of the town. This iron mask covered in bronze and silver was used by elite members of the Roman cavalry. It's equipped with a neck-protecting shield of bronze and silver and has a diadem, or a crown, featuring two male and three female figures. The Nijmegen helmet is just one of several Roman cavalry sports helmets that have been found throughout the area and elsewhere. At first, everyone thought these were just for parades and mock battles. I mean, this seems like it would be very hot and uncomfortable to wear in a real battle. However, a similar helmet to this one was found on a battlefield site among the debris, and another royal Roman tombstone found in Germany also had a man wearing this type of helmet. While not everyone wore these helmets, it's possible that a select few would wear these ornate masked helmets to show off a more symbolic role of power that would inspire the troops and strike fear in the hearts of the enemy. Another famous cavalry helmet is the Crosby Garrett helmet. Dating back to the 1st or 2nd century, the copper alloy headgear was discovered in 2010 by a metal detectorist in Cumbria, England. This site was once a Roman farming settlement located near a Roman road and army fort leading experts to believe that the helmet may have belonged to a local resident who served in the Roman army. The mask helmet was in pristine condition with wonderful detail. A curator at the British Museum described it as an immensely interesting and outstandingly important find. Its face mask is both extremely finely wrought and chillingly striking. It is a find of the greatest national and indeed international significance. While it may be important, it was made from a metal alloy of copper, zinc, and tin, so it did not qualify as a treasure. It was put up for auction, and while several museums scrambled to get the money together to purchase it, they were outbid by a private buyer who paid 2.3 million pounds. Golden Ring In mid-2018, metal detectorist Jason Massey discovered a Roman gold signet ring in the modern-day English town of Crewkern in Somerset. Dating back to sometime between 200 and 300 AD, the ring bears a black onyx featuring an engraving of the Roman god of victory driving two horses. After finding a stash of around 60 coins that day with the Detecting for Veterans group, Massey spotted what he initially thought was a gold coin contained among the hoard. It was the gold ring. There's a load of figures floating about for the value of the ring, but we're interested in the villa, who's lived there and where they've come from, and who the person was that wore this ring, Massey told the BBC. Whoever owned the ring was likely at least fairly wealthy, according to the Fiant's liaison officer, who said there are a couple of gold rings of that sort of date from Somerset, but they are not common. Colosseum in Turkey? Archaeologists working in western Turkey's province of Trales recently discovered an amphitheater similar to Rome's Colosseum. The structure, which remains mostly buried, represents a unique example of Eastern Roman architecture in the country. After finding the arena in the ancient city of Mastara, scientists dug up its outer walls. Around 80% of Mastara is buried, and archaeologists have only uncovered a small portion of it, but they believe that the structure is a rare discovery. This might be the only arena preserved in its entirety here in Turkey, explained Umut Tunser, head of the Directorate of Culture and Tourism in Aden. The preservation was maintained as it was buried for years. The basic outline is visible now, and we plan to unearth more this spring. The newly discovered amphitheater is the only one found in Turkey so far that isn't collapsed or destroyed. It rivals the size of the Colosseum, which measures 617 feet long and 512 feet wide and is also ovular in shape like the Colosseum. Mastara was built and rebuilt several times over by the Spartans, Phrygians, Ionians, Lydians, Persians, and finally the ancient Romans, who left behind fascinating archaeological ruins that reflect what everyday life was like 1800 years ago. Rome's First Migrants Sometime between the 1st and 3rd centuries AD, a group of four migrants traveled to Rome during its imperial era, when the city was a flourishing metropolis. But who were these people? Up to a million people were living there, biological anthropologist Christina Kilgrove told Life Science. 
adding the population ebbed and flowed, you had people who were migrating in, and you had people who were dying and people who were migrating out. Kilgrove further explained that while historians estimate that around 40% of ancient Rome's population consisted of slaves, no such records exist to verify this theory. She searched two cemeteries just outside Rome's walls for signs of these people. Working with colleague Janet Montgomery of Durham University, Kilgrove analyzed the isotopes in the molars of 105 corpses, which provides a record of what a person ate and drank during their early years of life. Teeth are like little time capsules in your mouth. The results revealed that two men died between ages 35 and 50, an older man lived past the age of 50, and a teenager passed away when they were somewhere between 11 and 15 years old. The isotope analyses show that these four individuals almost certainly came from elsewhere. The four individuals represent the first people identified as migrants to the region during the Roman Imperial era. A few of the men came from places with much older rocks than the young volcanic rocks that are found throughout much of Italy, as evidenced by high levels of certain strontium isotopes. The nearest old rocks to the site would be in the Alps, or on certain islands in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Additionally, the oxygen isotope analysis indicates that the men could have been from the Alps, or somewhere else with a similar climate. The low strontium isotope levels in the adolescents suggest that they came from an environment rich in young limestones or basalt. Meanwhile, the high oxygen isotopes indicate that the person came from a hot climate, perhaps North Africa. It is still too hard to say whether these people were slaves or not. Rome's Lost Roads As technology advances, it's becoming easier for researchers to spot archaeological ruins and artifacts that might not be visible to the naked eye, including buried sites and structures that are only easily seen from a bird's eye view. The ancient Romans built an impressive road network throughout Britain after conquering the territory during the first century. While there are some surviving segments of these highways, they have largely disappeared from plain sight. In 2016, archaeologists and other experts detected what they believe may be remnants of Roman roads throughout northern England's countryside. Retired road engineer David Ratledge spent considerable time examining 18 years' worth of maps that the UK's Environment Agency compiled using a remote sensing technique called LIDAR. These 3D maps enable the viewer to see below vegetation and other obstructive features. In doing so, Ratledge identified what he believes is an 11-mile-long lost route between Ribchester and Lancaster. Additionally, the UK Environment Agency revealed in a statement that archaeologists Hugh Toller and Bryn Gethin identified four Roman roads, including a missing part of the Maiden Way, which connected the Roman fort of Bravoniacum to that of Magnae, the latter of which was situated along Hadrian's Wall. Discoveries like this highlight the efficiency and importance of technologies like LIDAR, which enable experts to look beneath the surface without actually digging. The Buried Centaur In a surprising turn of events, archaeologists were doing routine excavations in the small French town of Evreux before a construction project was going to start. Dating back to the 1st century BC, it became an important and bustling city during the 1st century AD during the Augustan period of the Roman Empire. It had a theater, big walls covered in frescoes, villas, and Roman bathhouses. 2,000 years later, excavations revealed what at first glance appeared to be a centaur buried inside a small necropolis. You can imagine the misbelief when archaeologists found it. Could it be true? Apparently not, but pretty dang close. What they thought was a centaur at first was actually a grave with the bones of men and horses stacked on top of one another. The way the skeletons were found, it looks like the human skull is attached to the skeletal neck of the horse. The surrounding graves had similar findings. There were adults found buried in some very strange positions, many of them face down and several of them with their limbs twisted into unusual positions. Nobody is entirely sure why this happened, and nobody knows why large pieces of horses were also placed inside the graves alongside them. According to researchers, the deliberate act of burying horses and humans together is entirely unique to France. To this day, nobody is sure what the purpose of such burials were. Perhaps the ancient people in the area were worshipping the Gaelic goddess Epona, who was believed to be a goddess of fertility and the protector of horses and ponies. The Millipede Swarm In Japan, there is a disturbing phenomenon in which horrifying swarms of millipedes get together in such massive clusters that they are able to disrupt the entire country's train network. Apparently, this has been going on for quite some time, and a new study has revealed that the clusters of millipedes actually emerge every eight years to wreak havoc on Japan. 
Scientists have now learned that the millipedes have an eight-year life cycle, which makes them the only other periodical animal next to cicadas, meaning the only other animal that breeds in cycles separated by many years. Researchers were able to make their findings after studying broods of these slimy freaks for 50 years. Ecologist Keiko Nijima has been gathering data on millipedes since the 1970s, although there have been reports of massive swarms of them blocking trains that date back to the 1920s. If you're wondering just how problematic a swarm of millipedes can really be, these clusters can stretch out to be over 600 feet in length. Even though each millipede is only around an inch long, they put all their bodies together to create the largest and most disgusting mass of creepy crawlies in the entire world. But what's really fascinating is that they only live for a short time. The female will crawl no more than 200 feet to copulate and lay her eggs and then die. And eight years later, those eggs hatch and do the same thing. Knives made from human bones In New Guinea, ancient warriors used to craft daggers from human bones, which they then used to finish off their enemies in brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. A recent study published in the journal Royal Society Open Science details how these people engineered their daggers from human bones to make them superb weapons. They took their raw material from thigh bones, but not just anyone's thigh bone. It was always the skeleton of their fathers or other dead men of status in the community who had already proven themselves in battle. These guys literally carved their weapons out of the remains of their courageous dead relatives. A large cache of bone daggers from New Guinea was first inspected by biological anthropologist Nathaniel Dominey after he found a drawer full of them at the Hood Museum of Art in Dartmouth College, where they had been stashed away after being recovered in the late 19th century, the same century that they were made. In the Sepik region of New Guinea, warriors were arming themselves with bone daggers and using them to raid neighboring groups. Nathaniel found that the bone daggers were crafted with expert precision, with exceptionally flat designs that created less friction when stabbing an enemy. They often had elaborate designs and patterns incised on the daggers to project a feeling of power and menace and instill fear. Can you believe these daggers were just stashed away and forgotten about? What else do you think could be hiding in drawers and museums? Let me know in the comments below. Stardust In a rather frightening discovery, scientists have found stardust left behind by a meteorite that crashed into Australia 50 years ago. And while stardust itself isn't that scary, the fact that the stardust formed sometime between 5 to 7 billion years ago makes the discovery kind of overwhelming and a little scary. Though of course not in the way that finding a skeleton in the backyard would scare you. This is scary in the trying to imagine the vast scope of 7 billion years in the universe and how small we are in comparison scary. According to the report from Science Daily, the stardust has been confirmed as the oldest solid material ever discovered on our planet. Philip Heck from the Field Museum said that investigating the stardust was one of the most exciting studies he ever worked on. When stars die, they pitch the particles that formed in their winds out into space and those bits of stardust eventually form new stars along with new planets and moons and meteorites. But what exactly is stardust? The material is a type of grainy substance that was formed before our sun was even born. The fragments are literally solid samples that came from an exploded star. What likely happened is that after a 7 billion year old star somewhere far away in the universe burned out, it exploded into a storm of dust and gas. Some of that dust floated away and landed on a meteorite, and that meteorite sailed directly into our planet. And that's where stardust comes from. These grains and particles are rare and are only found in about 5% of meteorites that hit Earth. And further study could reveal even more eye-opening secrets about this vast and breathtaking universe we live in. The Sinister Roman Helmet A kind of creepy Roman cavalry helmet was discovered in Lancashire in the northwest of England. But it wasn't found by professional archaeologists. Instead, it was found by a 13-year-old boy who stumbled upon it completely by accident in 1796. The son of a clogmaker, he was playing in a riverbed when he stumbled upon an entire Roman horde, buried in a hollow and full of a bunch of corroded metal. The helmet mimics a sinister face, complete with creepy eyes, nose, and lips. At one point, there was even a sphinx attached to the top of the helmet, but over the years, it has since been lost. Only two other helmets like this have been discovered in Britain, making this an extremely rare discovery. The hoard of metal items most likely belonged to a Roman soldier from about 120 AD. Along with the ominous Roman helmet, there were also the remains of a vase, a statue of the Roman goddess Minerva, and other strange artifacts that may have served a religious function. 
The helmet itself dates back to the late 1st century AD. It was a type of helmet worn by Roman cavalrymen, but this particular piece of headgear had impressive ornamentation that suggested it was too important to be used in battle, but probably used for either ceremonial or sporting purposes. The reason this type of helmet is so unique and slightly eerie even today is that it fit over the person's entire head, replacing their face with a ghoulish, lifeless face of bronze. It definitely was not easy to see through the thin eye holes, and breathing would have also been tough. Researchers are still wondering who exactly wore this particular helmet. Some believe that maybe it was used in battle, but maybe by just a few members of the cavalry to spook the enemy, although it would have been difficult to fight. Deer with hair on eyeballs This one is a bit gross and super scary. A deer was recently discovered stumbling through the wilderness of Tennessee with hair growing out of both its eyeballs like some sort of monster. And not just a little bit of hair either. The deer had thick brown hair literally growing out of its eyes, preventing the animal from being able to see. According to Live Science, the hair covered both corneas and may have been caused by a benign tumor somewhere in the animal's body. The rare condition has been blamed on corneal dermoids, which is something that happens when a tissue grows in the wrong place. In the case of this unfortunate deer, its skin tissue began growing on its eyeballs, which resulted in hair follicles growing from the skin tissue and blinding the animal. It's a bizarre mystery how the deer managed to survive as long as it did. It was about a year old when it was discovered wandering through a suburb near Knoxville in August of 2020. The National Deer Association even investigated the incident and found the deer to be bleeding and in great distress. The poor deer was so blind by all the hair in its eyes that it couldn't see where it was going and could likely only tell the difference between day and night. Animal control officers decided to do the humane thing and put the animal down. Invasion of the Murder Hornet In a terrifying insect discovery in 2020, murder hornets were found inside the United States for the very first time, and they were ready to begin starting colonies of their own and murdering citizens of the U.S. in record numbers. Just kidding. Not that extreme, but scientists were pretty worried. So were beekeepers. Just three of these things will destroy a whole hive of honeybees in 30 minutes. Entomologists in Washington state destroyed the murder hornet nest after discovering it in late October, just in time to prevent as many as 200 new queens from each establishing their own nest. As you can imagine, this would have caused a widespread invasion that could have led to numerous fatalities. The nest was first discovered by the State Department of Agriculture, who quickly vacuumed the bugs out of the nest and cracked it open to discover 76 living queens and 108 queens developing inside of their small cell capsules. Unfortunately, the state managing entomologist told reporters during a press conference that some queens may have escaped just in the nick of time, which means they could be ready to establish hives of their own on the west coast, so everyone needs to keep an eye out. Murder hornets, also known as Asian giant hornets, are native to Southeast Asia and can grow to be three inches in length. They have very nasty stings, can sting over and over, and are extremely predatory. They need meat to feed their young and will kill off the adult honeybees and take the young ones to feed their young hornet babies. An invasion of these hornets would be extremely dangerous to the ecosystem. Ghost Human Ancestor in a rather spooky discovery, researchers have discovered a mysterious ghost population of ancient humanoid creatures that went extinct after interbreeding with the earliest humans residing in West Africa. According to the report from the BBC, researchers have determined that DNA from this ancient ghost population currently comprises between 2% and 19% of the genetic ancestry of those still living in West Africa. Researchers also say that the interbreeding between this curious missing link and modern humans went down about 43,000 years ago. One of the reasons this could be a frightening discovery is that scientists believe they have revealed yet another undiscovered species of ancient human. We already know that European Homo sapiens mixed with the Neanderthals, humans of the oceanic part of the Earth mixed with ancient Denisovans, and so on. But there is some DNA floating around that we don't know where it came from. We are missing a group of humanoids. There were multiple groups of early humans mixing with other groups of ancient humanoids. However, nobody knows exactly how we came to be as we are today. Who were our ghost ancestors? This is proof of just how little we know about our own history. Hell Ants A fossil of something known as a hell ant was recently discovered by archaeologists. The fossil shows that the hell ant was in the act of attacking its next victim. This discovery is incredibly rare, as the ant was literally frozen during its attack. 
It has provided experts with an unprecedented view of how these extinct and hellish insects once hunted using their scythe-like jaws and savage horns. The fossil has been dated at 99 million years old, and it was found preserved in amber in the country of Myanmar. Found along with the extinct hell ant was its victim, an extinct relative of the modern cockroach. Now, what makes the extinct ant so much more horrifying than modern ants is the way that it used its deadly jaws. Modern ants have mouths that move horizontally, but these ancient ants had mouths that moved vertically, and they also had sharp horns that stuck out of their heads. Thanks to this new fossil evidence, scientists know that the hell ant used its jaws to hold its prey still while it stabbed its victim with its horns. But fortunately for us, these insects went extinct about 66 million years ago, alongside the last dinosaurs. Bones Beneath Medieval Church Archaeologists working in Poland have uncovered a scary horde of human remains while in the middle of conserving a medieval church. Located in the small Polish city of Dansk, it took two years of digging out and analyzing thousands of bones. They came out in all shapes and sizes, and dating them has been a challenge. Archaeologists dug up the bones of at least 64 humans, including men, women, and children. Most of the bodies were likely buried beneath the church in the Middle Ages. Studying their remains has proved very insightful to scientists. For example, researchers found that the men and women buried beneath the church were about 3.9 inches taller than the people who later inhabited the city. Researchers blamed the shrinkage on the fact that the city grew overcrowded, there were frequent disease epidemics, and living conditions became worse and worse. After the excavations were complete, three skulls and a handful of bones were put inside of a wooden casket and carried down into the church's crypt, where the nameless dead will be remembered. Thanks for watching! Which of these discoveries was the strangest to you? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and come back soon for another video. See you later! Bye!